Can y'all hear me? Testing one, two, three. We're all good. Um, how you doing? My name's Child Medford. I'm gonna be going over the mean stack. Um, a little bit about myself. That's my name. Um, I'm a boot camp instructor, so here at Nashville Software School. Um, we've been around for a few years now. Um, I do the um, the Node stack, so the Node, Angular, JavaScript, all the JavaScript stuff. Some mobile stuff with uh, Cordova, things like that, PhoneGap. And then we, I've been teaching some, uh, some game development too with Phaser. So it's a pretty awesome curriculum. So if anyone wants to be a developer and you're not a developer, NSS is a good place to go. I teach there. There's my email address if you want to ping me, my Twitter. GitHub. I have tons and tons of repos on there because I'm a teacher, so I've got like <coughs> there, and I have other other ancillary repos. So I have two meetup groups: JavaScript Extreme, and I have another meetup group which I don't really use a whole lot. Um, it's electronics. It's called um, Skynet. It's been a while since I've done it. Uh, Skynet, and then yeah, that's where I teach at National Software School. So that's a bit about me. Okay, so this is about the mean stack. So some of you may be wondering, what's a stack, right? What is this thing called a stack? Um, well, a stack is kind of like the software that you develop uh, from the beginning all the way till the end, the entire, that's why they call it a stack. So the front end plus the back end. So all the, like the JavaScript, everything that happens in the browser, right? Through the communication into the server, into the web, the web app, and um, the database, so like the full, full life cycle. Well, I have a couple different types of stacks that I just threw up together. Now, these aren't necessarily the one you may use, but they're just some uh, like examples of stacks. So PHP, like, so first of all, in the front end, you're going to have JavaScript, right? Some sort of JavaScript framework. Maybe it's um, Angular or Backbone or something. Or maybe you're just maybe you're just rolling your own jQuery, or maybe you're just doing your own DOM manipulations, and then maybe you're gonna have like an Apache server, right? <coughs> Obviously, like PHP, and then maybe like a SQL database, MySQL, right? Does anyone in here do that? Anyone have like MySQL stack? Yeah, kind of cool, awesome. Or maybe Rails. Maybe you do Rails. Like, what, what does that stack look like? Well, it's some sort of JavaScript front end, you know, whatever. Maybe you use Unicorn as your web server. Maybe use Ruby as your language. Maybe have Rails as um, as the um, framework, web framework. And then maybe use Postgres, who knows, right? Of course you can use other things. These are just examples. Any Rails people in here? A couple of Rails people, awesome. Um, or a Microsoft stack, right? That, that's a different kind of stack. Maybe, once again, JavaScript on the front end, obviously, why? Because you can only run JavaScript in the browser. And then Microsoft, they have their own server, right, IIS. And then maybe you do C Sharp, ASP.NET, and then SQL Server, all right? So if you look at all these different stacks, there's something unique about all of them. Or, or, there's, or there's, something, there's, there's something that's the same about all of them. Does anyone know what, the, what those things are? Thanks. Um, yes, the JavaScript. And the other thing that's the same about them is that everywhere along the stack, you have to learn a different language or a different way of doing things. Like, if you're doing Microsoft, you're doing JavaScript, and then you want to do IIS, that's a completely different thing. It's a completely different thing. And then you want to learn C Sharp, that's a completely different thing. And ASP.NET, that's a completely different thing. And then you want to see SQL Server, that's a completely different thing. Same thing for Unicorn and Rails and Postgres and MySQL and PHP. Those are like usually like things you have to know one thing and you have to learn a completely different thing. Well, the beauty of the mean stack is that it's all JavaScript all the time. No context switching, one language to rule them all. So that's honestly, that is the beauty of the mean stack, is that you don't have to go, oh, I gotta learn one, one language or one framework or one operating system or, or whatever, and then, I gotta, and then I have to learn a completely different one, and then another one, right? Isn't that true for all the other ones? It's crap, isn't it? Well, what's cool about this is that once you learn JavaScript and JSON and how that works, it all actually flows perfectly through the entire mean stack. 
Um, so what is this thing, the mean stack? Well, it's um, mean, of course, mean stands for Mongo uh, Express Angular Node. But I kind of put it on the board different. Uh, I put JavaScript, obviously, they, le they left JavaScript out of the mean stack. Of course, it doesn't sound very good to say Jameen or something like that. I don't know, that doesn't quite. <laughs> So, even though JavaScript really is the core of, of all of them, so it's kind of ironic they, they left that out. Uh, but yeah, so it's Angular, Node, Express, and uh, Mongo. And so what do all these things have in common? They're all JavaScripty, right? They're all JavaScripty, so there's no context switching. Um, so it makes it really easy to switch between, you know, the database and the server and the, and the front end and all that. Uh, okay. So let's go through a couple of these things of the mean stack. First of all, JavaScript. What is it? Why would you want to learn it? Um, first of all, it's everywhere. Um, it's on every PC, phone, tablet um, that you can buy. So if you have a phone or a tablet that you just buy, does it run Ruby right off the, right off the bat? Does it run Python right off the bat? What if you're on Windows? I mean, you, know, you, can, install these, you can install these things. But I'll tell you what, every single phone you buy, doesn't matter how small it is, or every tablet you buy, not even if it's a crappy tablet, they all run JavaScript, right? So the JavaScript runtime is on every platform on the planet. Not really, maybe it's on your phone, maybe it's on your, on your refrigerator, but JavaScript's everywhere. Ruby's not, Python's not, Haskell's not, Scala's not, right? That's true, JavaScript is everywhere. So why, why, is, why, why would you want to learn it? Well, A, it's everywhere. Huge community, new libraries, frameworks. Hacker News loves JavaScript. You guys ever on Hacker News? You know, that's, that's where they talk about all those startup, startup -y stuff. I swear to God, you go in there every single day, there's five new JavaScript libraries that, that, they, that they announce. It's true, isn't it, if you're, if, you're, if you're ever on there. So JavaScript, why you want to learn it? There is so, it's like the ecosystem for JavaScript is insane. You guys know that, right? It's insane. Like you can't even keep up, to be, to be truthful about it. Um, it's the eighth most popular language on the TOB index. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, the fourth most popular language on Langpop, and then sixth most popular according to IEEE. If you go to GitHub and you look at the most starred repos that people said, yeah, I like this repo, they're all JavaScript. Or, or like if you look at the first, say, say 20, most of them are JavaScript. So, so people like JavaScript, it's popular. There we go. Awesome, so that's a, a bit about JavaScript. Um, Angular. So, what is Angular? So, that, so let me just pause for just a second. So, I'm going, to, I'm going over the mean stack. So, in, in this talk here, I'm just going to go over all the different components of the mean stack. If anyone has any questions about something, definitely raise your hand or yell at me or throw something. Um, I'll probably stop. Okay, Angular. So, we'll, tar we'll start at the front part of the stack. So, Angular, what is it? Well, it's a front-end MVC framework. Right? Well, I said MVC. Right there, I put MV star. Sometimes they call it MVW. You ever, ever heard of MVW? That means model view whatever. <laughs> model view whatever. Um, sometimes it stands for model view controller. Sometimes, sometimes it stands for model view view model. You know, it, it, can, it can mean different things to different people. Um, what are some of uh, uh, Angular's competition? Well, Backbone. Any, any Backbone people in here? Yeah, nice. And then uh, Ember. Any Ember people in here? Any Ember? Nice. So Angular is really cool because it kind of threads the difference between uh, Backbone and Ember, meaning Backbone is very super unopinionated. They just give you some um, this framework, but it's you can kind of just do whatever you want to, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah, you can kind of just do whatever you want. Ember is on the complete other side of Backbone, like they're diametrically opposed, which Ember is kind of like Rails. You know how Rails is opinionated? Rails is the opinionated framework. Well, the guy that did, does Ember, his name is Yehuda Katz. He's on, the Rails, he's on the Rails team. So the guy that does Rails is the same guy that does Ember. So if Rails is opinionated and he's on it, and he did Ember, so Ember is going to be opinionated too. 
Now, opinionated is good, right? Kind of. What does opinionated do for you? It means you can write less code because they're assuming a lot of things. They're like, we're going to assume you do this and this and this and this. You, if you, as long as you follow these patterns, then the code will just work out for you. But if you want to like, it's, like sort, it's sort of like Rails. If, if as soon as you want to like start doing something a little bit different, Ember doesn't like it, right? Ember doesn't like it. Um, so backbone is you can kind of do whatever you want. It's like Wild West. Ember is like stay on the stay on the path. Uh, Angular is like right in the middle. They, you know, it's sort of there's more structure to it, uh, but not as much structure as Ember. What else is good about Angular? Well, it's backed by Google. So Google's like what a half a trillion dollar company. So if I were to put my money on a framework, I'd probably want to put it on the largest company on the planet, right? <laughs> Right, if you're like a betting person, like who has the money and the funds to back something? Probably, probably <coughs> Google. Uh, and then they have a fast iteration cycle. They're always iterating. They're, they're on like 1.3 now, and some of you guys probably know they're working on version two pretty soon, which is gonna be different. Different, yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll have to see how that turns out. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about Angular and what makes it super awesome. For, first, I'll raise, raise your hands. How many of you have done Angular? Oh wow, there's a lot of Angular people in here, so you guys probably all know this stuff, but we'll just kind of just jam through it. Um, what makes Angular cool? Directives. Directives are what makes it cool, right? So in your HTML, you can be declarative. You can say, oh, I want to, you know, I want to just re repeat something by saying ng repeat. Or you can do something even cooler. You can make like your own component, your own web component. Like here, I have like a stock component or a calendar component, or you know, it's like, like you can think of them as widgets, right? And wouldn't it be cool to just have a web page where you just said, "Oh, here's a stock widget that maybe it automatically refreshed and did polling for you, and all you had to say was <coughs> empty stock some attribute equals that." Wouldn't that be wouldn't that be a great thing to do? Well, you can actually do that in Angular. You can make these awesome directives and then just pop them on your page, just like that. So that's what makes Angular cool. Um, the other thing is Angular has this thing called scope. You guys know about all, the, all that scope? Is scope awesome? Yeah, yeah scope is awesome. Um, another thing that's cool about scope and how Angular works is it has this really cool thing on here. This is a little nerdy. Uh, it's called broadcast, and that allows you to talk from, say, controller to controller. All right, you guys ever done that? Had a bunch of controllers on your page and you're just talking amongst them using broadcast? You guys ever done that? It's awesome. It's totally awesome. So if you ever want to like talk from, if you don't know this, if you ever want to talk like from controller to controller to controller, imagine you have a page with like three controllers on it, five controllers. You can actually talk amongst the controllers by sending a messages and it's sort of like a transmitter and then you can and then another controller can like listen for that message and then receive it and then do something. So they can like talk back and forth using this broadcast mechanism. It's really cool. Um, data binding. So um, Angular has this thing called data binding. So one of the most coolest things about Angular is you can create a variable, right? an object, let's say you create an object, and then you can create something in your DOM, some HTML. What's cool is when the variable changes, the DOM changes automatically. Or conversely, it has this thing called two-way data, two data binding, which means if you change the DOM, like let's say you're typing in a text box, the, uh, the object changes too. So they're actually, it's like a two-way sy uh, synchronization. So. If you've never seen it before, that, that data binding work, it is like mind blowing. If you've ever come from like a jQuery background where you have to listen for event, on click, you know, and you're listening for something, you do dot text or whatever. This is like really crazy. Right here, right, those um, double brackets or whatever, H plus three, that's, a, that's a, a, a binding expression. So I have some, I have some object in scope like age and if age changes then age on my page changes so data binding is super awesome super powerful um the routing system is in, in angular is pretty good now they have a built-in default routing system which is okay it's okay it's, it's nothing to write home about it's okay but i would definitely recommend you guys if you are angular people in here use angular ui router would you agree with that you angular people yes um, Angular UI router, if you haven't done this, you need to write it down and go to this web page because it's super awesome. 
what Angular UI router does is it says it says URLs. Nah, we're not doing that anymore. I mean, you are, you still actually do URLs under the covers, but actually, add this UI router. It routes based on states. You guys ever heard of like a state machine where you're on state A, state B, state C, state D? Um, in this in this Angular UI router thing, you can actually say, oh, I'm in state A. And it just automatically switches your URLs for you. Or I'm in state C, or I'm in state D, or I'm in state E. So you don't have to think about like what URL you're at. That doesn't make a lot of sense. It actually, you, you just tell it what state you're in and it changes your URLs for you. So that's pretty cool. Another thing neat about Angular is that it has dependency injection. You guys ever done that in Angular? Super awesome. See, so if you ever have like a function, like a controller or a service or a factory or whatever, you have to inject the dependencies in at runtime. And why is that really good? Well, that's for that's my <coughs> next line here. Testing, 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 testing. If you have to, if you have to, and, and Angular forces you, if you have to inject all your dependencies in to a, to a function like a controller, then that makes it really easy to mock out, doesn't it, or stub in your testing. And so Angular uses, there's two types of testing tools usually people use for Angular. One's called Karma. That's for like unit testing in Angular. And then the other one is called Protractor which is for end-to-end -end testing. So if you want to test end-to-end, -to -end, you, you use Protractor. If you're just doing like unit testing, you probably want to use Karma. But Angular was actually built from the ground up to be tested, right? That was one of the, that was one of the core things. They're like, we want this thing to be super testable. And so that's why they do dependency injection. Okay, that's Angular. All right, so we're moving on down the stack. We're talking about Node now. So Node, what is so awesome about Node? Well, there's a lot that's awesome about Node. Um, it's event-driven, non-blocking I.O. It's asynchronous. It's fast. Fast, fast, fast. Um, let's see here. If you, go to the Node, if you go to Node's website, they actually say these things. And it's kind of like in big, large bullet points. And a lot of people, they see these words. And they're like not really sure why that's important or why that's awesome. Um, but Node was actually inspired by um, Rails has this framework, uh, this library called Event Machine. And Python has one called Twisted. You guys ever heard of that before? Yeah. Uh, Node was actually inspired by that. So here's the, let me, let me just lay out the problem to you. And I'll show you how Node solves that problem. The problem is, here you are, you're in, you're in your computer, right? You're inside a CPU, and there's some RAM here, and you need to like do something. So you make a call out, and you do something inside your processor. That's great, right? No problem. But what happens when you want to call a database? So there's a database over there, but, he, but the database isn't actually right there. The database is um, 100 miles away, just theoretically. <clears throat> But that's a kind of a dumb example. <laughs> let's let's say it's like you know a couple hundred feet away. Well, you still have to leave that computer and go through the network and down and find this database, make a call, and come back. The you know the response comes back and into your system. Or an even better example is what 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 happens if you want to make an HTTP call, like a web service call, right? Here you are, you're in your node thing, and you need to make, you need to call some stock service. Well, the stock service is, a, is another service on the other side of the planet, right? Now, someone come in, some person made a request to you. They want some stock quote. And then you have to make another request out to go get that quote because you're going to like do some formatting or whatever. And then you're, you're going to turn the answer back to them. Well, what PHP does and what Ruby does and what Python does and all these frameworks do, what well, they all do is they block. They all block. Do you know what I mean by block? Well, I just mean by default. Yeah. By default. You don't have to, like, right. Well, I mean, yeah, there are definitely workarounds, and I'm just saying like the, the, the default behavior is. So blocking means someone comes to me, and they say, let me just give you like a human example. Some, someone comes to me and says, hey, child, I want you to go do something for me. What, uh, what these other computers do is they're like, you, you actually have to go off and go do this while they're waiting for you. And so imagine there's 10 people 
that want to ask me something. Well, if some if person A comes to me and they ask me for something, I have to like go do it. And then let's say it takes me 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And then I finally come back and I go, here, person A, here's your answer. Now then I can go, person B, give me your question. You see that? Node doesn't do that. Node says, person A comes to me and says, hey, give me, give me some data. And I'm like, okay. And I throw it off to someone else. And then I go to person B instantly. What's your question? And then I throw that off to, to, to someone else. And so what that really means is, is I, as a node server, can handle lots of requests really fast because these other systems, they block. They're just like, okay, you want to get some data? Well, I'm just going to wait however long, seconds, minutes, who, know, who knows, for that response to come back. Node doesn't do it. That's the beauty of Node, and that's actually built in from the very core, is to be asynchronous. It means Node does not, that's why I always tell my students, Node does not wait. It doesn't wait for anything. Um, and actually in the Node core, in the Node library, they actually have these APIs if you want to wait for something that's called it's called sync or synchronous um, you actually have to specifically say sync read or sync write and they make it like in big bold things and they write this name really ugly specifically because they don't want you using them now you can use them if you want uh, but they make it really hard to do synchronous programming um, so notice asynchronous from the ground up now that sounds really awesome doesn't it now what's cool about that is you can have one single thread node I mean sorry node when when node runs it's single threaded you know how many how many requ requests node can handle with just one thread thousands tens of thousands hundreds of thousands it screams it screams and people are like they're, they're, they're so surprised by that well the, the reason is because it's asynchronous now for those of you that have done asynchronous programming before has anyone done asynchronous programming so there's a downside to this, right? There, this, it, like it's not all roses and sunshine. <laughs> uh, the downside is asynchronous programming is not probably the best programming model in the whole world. You guys ever heard of callback hell and the and the pyramid of doom? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, asynchronous programming is not that. If, if you've done it a while, it's okay. But it's not the, and of course they have promises and things like that that make these things better. But asynchronous programming is not the best. But the the, the perform no one ever says Node is slow. If you ever talk about Node, it, it Node is synonymous with fast. So, but the downside is the programming is probably not the best in the world. What else is cool about Node? Well, if you look up here, this little green thing. This is actually the only image I have here. Um, this is actually the first time I ever I ever do slides. Most of the time I just I'm coding in front of people, but. Um, this green thing is the number of node modules out there. Now, if you notice something, there are more node modules out there than any other language. Is that crazy? So, so you're wondering like, why would I want to do node? Why would I want to do JavaScript? Well, look at this. There's actually more node. If you want to like find a node module that does whatever you could possibly think of, guess what? It has it. There's probably like 10, 10 modules for everything you could possibly think of. Yeah, it passed Ruby gems like a while ago. You probably think Ruby, like the gems, like there's probably more of those. Nope, there's actually more node modules. I was actually surprised by that too. Um, so there's Node. Node is actually built on Google's V8 engine, for those of you that don't know. Um, node has a minimal surface area, which means there's not really a whole lot to Node. They try to keep it you know, as minimal as possible. It's single threaded. You, you spin it up, it just has one thread. One process has one thread. If you want to run it multi-threaded or whatever, you actually have to spin up multiple processes of it. They have this package called Cluster. You guys ever heard of Cluster before? It's part of Node. It actually lets you run Node and uh, it spins up multiple versions of Node in, in different processes. Node has an event loop, right? Uh, Node is, Node is uh, cross-platform, Windows, Linux, Mac. It runs on everything. That's really cool. Um, it has the common JS module loader. So you probably, you know, if you guys have done JavaScript like in the old days, it's sort of like PHP, right? In the old days where it's just like spaghetti code, just like one, you put all your code in one file and it's just all nasty. Well, in Node.js, they got rid of that. They're like, we need to like modularize our code. And so when you write a Node file, 
you can export out certain functions that you want to be exported out and then another file you import those functions in so it makes it makes node like very modular and they, they use what's called a common JS module loader pattern for, for loading in these modules so that that's really cool uh, another thing that you can do with node is you can make terminal apps like console apps you can make uh, obviously web, web apps and you can make desktop apps too um, I'm running Adam you guys ever heard of Adam Adam.io from from uh, from uh, GitHub. yeah github Adam it is actually node did you guys know that yeah, yeah Adam a Adam is is I think it's node webkit specifically right is that right node webkit um, so Adam is a desktop app that actually runs on node so you can actually make desktop apps web apps and command line apps from Node, so that's pretty cool. All right, so let's talk about Express now. So Node is the server, and then Express is the web application framework. Um, it's minimal, it's fast, it's unopinionated. What I like about Express is just, it's, there's not a lot to it. You get, anyone done, raise your hand if you've you done Express? Anyone, Express, Express, cool. Um, you guys like it? Yeah, it's very it's very minimal, right? But it, it's it, like it takes you like 30 minutes to learn it. It's it's super easy. Um, what's cool about it is they have plugins for everything. Like you know, so Express doesn't really do a lot, but you can do plugins for like static file serving, um, session management, Redis, um, logging, whatever you want. So it has tons of plugins for that. It has a, it has a pretty simple router, but. I like that. Um, it has a middleware function where you can actually chain functions together. You got function one. You can have like a request come in, and then you can you can push that through a function, and then push that through another function, and another function, another function, and another function, and you can chain those functions together. That's pretty cool. Uh, Express has templates, just like most languages, uh, web frameworks have templates. It defaults to EJS, embedded JavaScript, but you can do Jade or whatever whatever other type of template you want to use. Testing, usually people use Mocha with um, with Express. Any Mocha developers in here? Mocha? Yeah, cool, awesome. Um, um, fun fact, Mocha is written by the same guy that wrote Express. Did you guys know that? Another fun fact, the same guy that wrote Express, that wrote Mocha, also wrote Jade. <laughs> he doesn't have a life, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that is a fun fact. Um, yes, okay, so there, that's Express. Now we're gonna go down to Mongo. We're almost finished. Mongo. Uh, raise your hands. How many Mongo people are in here? Mongo. Mongo is actually the leading NoSQL database. Uh, so NoSQL. So uh, SQL, of course, is a uh, um, something query language. Help me out. <laughs> structured query language. S stands for so yeah, structured query language. Exactly. Uh, NoSQL. So SQL is a relational. It's a relational um, database, right? With tables, columns, and rows, and you you string these tables together with relationships with like joins, right? NoSQL isn't isn't that. This database is a bunch of JSON is a bunch of JSON documents, right? And they call them and you when you put them all together, you put them in this thing called a called a collection. So a collection is kind of like a table, and um, the documents are sort of like rows. Uh, but yeah, so the, what's cool about Mongo is once you create, it's remember it's all JavaScript, right? So you have JavaScript on the client. On the server, you have JavaScript. You create some JavaScript object, and then you pass Mongo your JavaScript object, and it saves it as JavaScript object, <laughs> right? So it's JavaScript all the way down. Um, but actually, and while that is true, the internals, like if you're looking at the internals of Mongo, it actually internally saves it as BSON. That stands for bi binary JSON. So they take this JSON format and kind of convert to binary format. Uh, but it's called BSON. Um, you can in, you can put an index on any attribute that you want. Um, it has replication, sharding. Sharding allows you to scale your database horizontally. So let's say you have I don't know a database of people's names. You can shard it on like say their last name. So like A through D is in this shard, and then D through M is in this shard, and then D through Z is in this shard. And so you can charge your database, and that allows you to scale horizontally. So if you want if you want better performance, it has auto sharding too. As a document-based query syntax, as MapReduce, 
Um, and if you don't like doing like low level stuff, you want like a higher level API. For those of you that, that want a little FYI, there's this there's this library there called Mongoose. Yeah, so if you ever use Mongo, you know they have a low level Mongo driver for it, which is fine. Uh, but I would probably recommend you use Mongoose, which is like a higher level abstraction. It has validation and business logic, and it's just a, it's just a nicer layer on top of Mongo. You, anyone, anyone, ever, anyone ever try Mongoose? Yeah, it's you guys like it? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's awesome. So that is yes, yes. Um, Says so Mongo. Well, that's good because this is the last slide, I think. Yep. And I just did that. That was goofy. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about build tools. Um, so you can't really talk about the mean stack without talking about build build tools. Um, Grunt. Anyone here use Grunt? Do you guys like Grunt? Grunt's awesome, except when you have to write the Grunt file, isn't it? Like if someone gives you the grunt file, you're like, this is amazing. But writing the grunt file is not so amazing. Uh, but grunt is cool. Now, for those of you that are in grunt hell and you want to be like saved, gulp is like the new kid on the block. And I can tell you, I don't really like, grunt is nice, but like writing is bad. I picked up gulp like super fast. Um, it is much easier to write your code in gulp than it is in grunt, but they do, both do the same thing. They're both just task runners. Um, but um, if you're just starting out and you want to write your own um, tasks, then I would, I, would I would suggest use Gulp. Now, what do these task runners allow, allow you to do? Well, they allow you to minify your code, uglify it like your JavaScript. They can uglify it. That means like change, uh, change names, make, make the names smaller. Um, they can con concatenate things. Like conca they can concatenate your JavaScript together. They can concatenate your CSS together. Um, they can copy, move files around. They can do linting. Right, you can do linting, you can do style syntax, they can run your tests. So these build tools, you just I, when I run them, I just run grunt, and every time I change a file, it just goes through this whole litany of things. Um, it's super awesome and super amazing. Uh, so there's that. Um, other build tools are part of the whole system. Is npm, of course, we talked about that, the Node Package Manager. npm is for the, is for installing dependencies on the server side, and then there's another one called Bower. Has ever heard of Bower? Yeah, Bower is for Bower is just like npm, but it's for uh, client side dependencies like underscore js, um, jQuery, Bootstrap, things like that. Things that run in the browser, you can you can manage that with Bower. So if you guys aren't running a dependency management system, some people just like ah screw the browser, you know, it's just like it's the wild west. But you can definitely use browser to help manage and contain those dependencies. And the last thing is Yeoman generators. Um, you guys ever heard of Yeoman before? Um, so you can just say, Yo you can install Yeoman and the command is yo. You can say, hey Yeoman, give me an Angular template. Boom, he gives you an Angular template with all the grunt tasks or gulp tasks already built in. So if you're like, I don't know gulp, I don't know grunt, this Yeoman generator will actually generate the whole project for you. And they have tons and tons and tons of generators. So if you want to like do a Meteor thing or, or, a, or a, Angular or whatever you can think of. They have tons of generators. They'll just generate the whole project for you. So that's Yeoman. Anyway, that is the mean stack. Like I said, it's super awesome. What's really great about it, like I said, is it's JavaScript all the way down. So there's not a lot of context switching and other things. You know, like Node is really fast and yeah, it's just a really great framework. That's what we use at school. So that's it, guys. And now it's for the party, party time.